Good morning and welcome to the Shankman Private Client Group Accountant Attorney Winter Webinar Series. This program is entitled State of the Art Market. For those who don't know me, my name is Jonathan Shankman and I'm a financial advisor, portfolio manager, and an accredited investment fiduciary at Oppenheimer based in New York City. The goal of all my programs is to bring professionals together to help them better serve their clients. This is done by educating attendees on the latest topics in wealth planning and by encouraging collaboration between a client's attorney, CPA, and financial advisor where appropriate. My practice focuses on working with high net worth families, businesses, and not for profits. I manage individual investment portfolios, trust accounts, corporate retirement plans, and endowments to help my clients achieve their financial goals. <clears throat> in addition to the 15 to 20 events I run every year, I also do a fair amount of writing on the topics of investing and financial planning. You can read my work in Barron's, CNBC, Forbes, Kiplinger, The Wall Street Journal, The CPA Journal, Trust and Estates Magazine, and many other periodicals. My latest article was published yesterday in Forbes and is entitled, Don't Let Anchoring Sink Your Retirement Strategy. After the program, I'll send out a link to this article and all the publications where I publish my work. Today, we're privileged to hear from Sherry Cohn, who's Vice President and Director of Evaluations, Trust and Estates Department at Bonhams. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Bonhams is a privately owned international auction house and one of the world's oldest and largest auctioneers of fine art and antiques. Sherry is a US and UK qualified attorney with decades of art experience. She works with fiduciaries to develop creative strategies to value and sell all kinds of property from fine art and Asian art to jewelry and rare books. Before joining Bonhams, Sherry underwrote art insurance, handled Nazi looted art cases and was an associate at the top international law firm. Today, Sherry will be speaking on the state of the art market. And with that, I will turn it over to Sherry. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you virtually. Um, as Jonathan said, I'm an attorney, but I'm not a tax attorney. And of course, it's always best practice to rely on an attorney, tax counsel, and someone who's familiar with federal and state laws, and in particular, who has experience when dealing with art and collectibles. Um, in my role at Bonhams, I'm, I'm very actively involved in our trust and estates department, and I also lead our U.S. business development across the country and really North America because we have um, offices in Toronto as well as Vancouver. Um, so in my role, I assist attorneys, fiduciaries, and clients with their management of all kinds of property, tangible per personal property, or TPP as we say kind of in the legal world. And that includes everything from fine art, jewelry, Asian art, motor cars, and collectibles. And we help with valuations um, and collection management and everything up to sales strategy if and when you know, clients need to sell or want to sell. So in my time today, I'd like to address a couple of um, interesting topics. Number one, give you guys an update on valuation appraisal practices in times of COVID speak to what's happening in the art market, which has been kind of an, an interesting um, development in the last year or so, and then talk about how we've pivoted with digital innovation. And then of course, draw some uh, conclusions about what we call the new normal. So first two appraisals. Everyone can kind of remember those tough days in March and April. Uh, when the world seemed to have come to a hard stop, or at least the business world. Um, and the same was true for valuations. And we slowly started back with completing valuations, which were already underway, and then really up to a fever pitch at the end of the year. Um, when I talk about valuations, I'm talking about a couple of different kinds of reports. The first being insurance, and then the most kind of far reaching category is what we call fair market value, which includes valuations of tangible personal property for tax purposes. That's what the IRS would look to for gift and charitable donations, um, as well as auction estimates, which is really a marketing tool and something that we use uh, when bringing a property to auction. Our valuations were conducted virtually at first, and we're still kind of doing that now um, to the extent that we can with in-person visits to follow. We're not doing as many initial walkthrough visits um, because for practical purposes, it just doesn't make as much sense to have um, unnecessary exposure. We're also consolidating the number of specialists required on site where possible. So for instance, if we could have one person that's covering prints and photographs 
um, that might make sense where in the past we may have sent um, a, in particular a print specialist as well as a photograph a specialist. Documentation has always been key in starting an appraisal and I think it's obviously more important now than ever. When I refer about uh, documentation, I'm talking about invoices, bills of sale, catalog, raisonné references, other kinds of literature, um, exhibition history. This is an image on the slide here of you can see of pictures that have been exhibited. It's always really great to know uh, where particular paintings may have been shown before. Um, and old appraisals or old insurance listings. All of that information is really critical for starting the appraisal um, and can be a, a great way to do that without you know, having to start from scratch with a visit. We follow um, all social distancing, so making sure people at risk are out of the home when we're in the home. Again, I said fewer appraisers if possible. Um, and of course, we're taking lots of tests and precautions with PPE. I mean, at the bottom of, at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that our clients are comfortable with the process. Um, something else to note under the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, USPAP as it's known, you actually do not need to physically see the property uh, to, to be able to prepare a qualified appraisal if the appraiser is comfortable with the condition and the authenticity of the work and has a credible basis to make some determinations. And they can do that obviously with insight visit, on-site visits, if that's not possible. Um, the, the technological advances in photography, high resolution photography has really been um, very helpful as well as um, videos and Zoom, um, Zoom viewings. I had an instance where we were looking at um, a piece that could have been a Renoir. We had photographs. It, it, we weren't really sure what it was based on the photographs um, themselves. And then we did a zoom and we're able to get really close up to the signature. And my specialist was like, no, that's not right. Uh, based on kind of that zoom meeting. We have seen an increase in appraisal demand um, in particular for fair market value appraisals. And that really hit the fever pitch. I would say, you know, late fall till the end of the year. My, my colleagues in our appraisal practice department were incredibly busy. Um, there have been concerns about what uh, the Biden administration will do in terms of the exemption level. And so people were making preemptive gifts of art and trying to maximize that exemption with art in particular um, that may have had a low basis. There is more awareness, I would say, um, in wealth portfolios in terms of collectibles and art. And it's always a good idea to get a handle on what that valuation is. Um, ahead of time. So to be ready and nimble if and when um, these changes come that we are pretty much all anticipating. I want to turn now to talk about digital innovation and in auctions. So before 2020, uh, Bonhams and the other big international auction houses had all invested in technology. So this wasn't something new. In a weird way, we were kind of ready uh, for the pandemic from an IT perspective, which of course exponentially accelerated um, what we call our online sales. So before last year, online sales were kind of a blip. Um, they rose by over 60%. And Bonhams and all the international houses created something called, um, well, that's kind of the fun part. There are lots of names, but it's all the same thing. Some people call it an online sale. I've heard clicks and bricks, live stream, behind closed doors. Um, and this is kind of a silly name, but QVC for oligarchs. So what it is, is it's an auctioneer basically in an empty room, perhaps with a few colleagues on the phone talking to clients. And they are taking bids through the internet. They're taking bids that have been placed ahead of time, which we call absentee bids on the books. And they're also taking bids on the phone from their colleagues. Um, I'm actually bidding in an auction tomorrow and I will be bidding on home, at home, on the phone, talking to clients and liaising uh, with my colleagues who are on the rostrum that way. So all of the houses applied this technology. It really got started um, in May. We were the first house to hold one of these hybrid live sales um, and sort of a, a fun story in that our auctioneer uh, rode his bike in Oxford. London was still shut down. We had the property in Los Angeles and phone bidders really across the country all from our, our kitchen tables. But, but luckily the technology worked um, and it was a, a pretty successful sale. Sotheby's used a multi-camera approach with a single auctioneer. 
Um, and Christie's um, had, a, had a sale called One, and they passed the gavel um, in four different locations back to back. I will say that you need to be patient with these sales. They are, are quite slow. So in a live sale, you could run through about 60 lots an hour. In an online sale, I mean, I've seen them go as slow as 20 lots an hour because you just have to kind of wait for the bids to painstakingly come through the technology online. Um, so I know that that can be frustrating for the clients and uh, my hat goes off to the auctioneers who are able to sometimes stay at the rostrum, you know, for four hours or so. I do think that live streaming sales will be around. It's certainly going to be part of our toolkit. Um, so now we have online only, which is that kind of eBay style um, kind of sale, as well as this hybrid live sale. And of course, hopefully when we're vaccinated and the world is safe, we'll have live auction sales filled with people um, in the galleries. Property um, has been available for preview by appointment when possible through, you know, video chats and Zooms. Um, some advances in virtual reality technology have made preview is really fun, um, a fun way to kind of navigate on your computer. And also um, there's programs where you can see the art on your wall. So all this stuff is try to make it easier for clients to engage with us online um, and make purchases. Again, photography is important from a selling perspective as well as from an appraising perspective. And buyers want to see more photos and higher quality um, I was talking to colleagues about a motor sale, and I think in some cases there are as many as 20 photos. So you can really get a sense for the condition of the car and, and what's going on with the property to gain that comfort to buy. Um, another factor is what we call condition reports. Sometimes they're done by third parties to create some sort of independence and there can be everything up to sort of conservation uh, recommendations. They're also done by the auction houses themselves. And those are posted online now um, and circulated really as early as possible for the sale. Again, a way for buyers to get comfort with the property that they will be bidding on. Um, another factor I would say is the reliance on the credibility of the auction houses, which is really critical. There is this always been a personal relationship with the specialist kind of as their advisors. And I would say that that um, is as important if ever now in these times. And I think that all of the factors that I've kind of described um, give comfort for, for buying artwork in the six, seven and eight figure price range, which we saw online um, in 2020. Again, ways to stay connected. We're doing our, our catalogs on the websites. We've um, like all the houses we've rolled out apps. So you can like literally bid without any paperwork, sign up to register to bid all through an app on your phone. Um, but I have to say, you know, as an art, as someone who admires art and has studied art history, there really is no replacement for that emotional experience of standing in front of art. As much as we're trying to recreate that, um, I think that that's something that that will hopefully get back to, and I think people will will appreciate. I wanted to talk now about some top prices because I think it's sort of this this really amazing phenomenon what we were able to achieve as a market last year. So while the total value of art sales was down by about 50%, um, there have been some interesting stats. So the market shrunk 30 to 40% to about 3.5 billion in 2020, and that's compared to 6 billion in 20, uh, uh, 2019. I'm really referring only to the publicly available auction results. Of course, there's a, a huge private market, which um, it's no secret really grew last year as well. The number of sales increased as much as threefold um, there were more frequent, but also um, more curated sales. Um, the volume of lots was up about 20%. And um, what happened in, is, is kind of a phenomenon as we were really um, struggling to kind of get ourselves together after the, the real shock of, of, of COVID and lockdown, um, we really had a phenomenal um, second half of the year and that online sales grew 900%. And that's not a typo in my notes, I don't believe. Um, you know, if you think back to where we were at that time, the fact that sales happened at all was quite miraculous. Art had been stuck, you know, in warehouses around the country. There were furloughs at the auction houses. So simple tasks like photography, which is required for cataloging, um, was difficult. So I can try to explain some of these phenomenal results that you can see on the slide here, um, is that collectors, true, 
passionate collectors are always eager to buy and they were eager to make acquisitions during times of COVID. There has been this pent up demand for high quality, fresh to market and conservatively priced lots. Um, many of the lots that were supposed to be offered in the spring that became offered in the summer came with uh, what we call guarantees. So they would be sold. Um, and then there was this depth of bidders, really uh, an interesting phenomenon. So registration was up at all the houses and certainly up on them 20 to 40% across the board in terms of category and also location of sales. Sell through rates were often in the 80, 90 and, and even 100 percentile, which we call white glove sales for many sales. Um, and I think, you know, as Jonathan knows all too well, the stock market was relatively stable. So the uber wealthy, high net worth people were not really affected by um, the sad economic downturn that has been related to the pandemic and kind of the loss of small businesses, certainly in my neighborhood in New York. Um, collectors were bored at home. You know, we've all been looking at our walls and, and collections and, and thinking about those kinds of things. And then one of my favorite uh, reasons, I think, is because the, just the joy of buying online, you know, retail therapy, it provided some relief to the anxiety uh, that we've all been feeling. And then last but not least, you know, art fairs were canceled, the physical art fairs. Um, there were virtual fairs. I just don't think the virtual art fairs translated as well as online act auctions to like that bidding experience. Um, I do have a theory that might be quite controversial and Jonathan and I were just talking about, you know, where we wanna travel after the pandemic, but that once normal life resumes and we're vaccinated, perhaps the market would be flooded with market uh, with material and perhaps people might not be as focused on bidding. We, we all wanna be out kind of traveling and partying and doing all sorts of wonderful things. Um, so highlights, you know, the, I, I believe the top lot sold was at Sotheby's, this bacon triptych sold for $84 million. We sold um, a great Richter painting um, for almost three and a half. Um, Phillips, had an amazing result by, by um, Matthew Wong, who's a Canadian artist who sadly you know, died by suicide way too young at 35. They had this picture mood room um, with an auction estimate of 60 to 80,000. And you can see the top price um, almost got up to 850,000, which is kind of amazing, shows the strength of bidding in the market. Um, the supply for new sourcing will remain and it always has been what we call the three Ds. So death, debt and divorce. Um, I think all of those factors, sadly, are more, more relevant now um, than ever in a pandemic. You know, we're still working with tons of estates that have property that need to be valued and need to be sold. Um, I would say that discretionary sellers, so people that don't need to sell for financial purposes or other reasons, might be more hesitant or discerning. And we have seen a touch of that. One more thing to talk about the market, hot trends. People always ask us, you know, what's happening now? Um, works by female artists um, are particularly in demand. Some museum directors have, have come out with a bold statement, which I, you know, admire, saying that they're only gonna buy works to kind of retro, uh, to, to address some of the inequities in the past by female artists. We sold this stunning uh, Ruth Asawa sculpture for $2 million. Um, she's now a, a really nationally, and world recognized sculptor for these beautiful wire forms. And this work was sold um, in our New York fine sale, but it stayed in our Los Angeles office when it was really hard to move property. And it was bought sight unseen by a buyer, a collector in Europe. Um, previously overlooked artists, African-American artists, African artists, um, this um, artist from Ghana, Amoka Bofo, has had a tremendous appeal this portrait of a young lady. He does these beautiful portraits that almost look like they're finger painted. It had an estimate of six to $9,000 and sold for 68,000. So again, lots of people are interested um, in new and emerging kind of artists and markets. The other factor um, that's kind of fun is that we have been focusing on luxury goods. It's a big thing now. Um, we've sold you know, whiskey bottles for almost a million dollars, handbags, Sneakers, um, Sotheby's sold a pair of sneakers of, that were uh, worn by Michael Jordan for a huge price. Um, and Banksy, you know, the pop artist Banksy and street art is also very much in demand. 
I want to talk about some blurred lines because I think there are quite a, a quite a few takeaways from what's happened last year. So the traditional sale calendar, calendar is gone for now. Historically, uh, fine art was sold in the fall, at least in New York, in, in uh, the fall and the spring. And last year, of course, that didn't happen. It, it was sold in the summer and then around the election in October, November, and then December. I mean, I don't think it's a false statement to say that it was really the busiest summer season ever last year in terms of the auction market. There, were, there was no summer siesta for us. Um, the election was another interesting factor. I know that some consigners were concerned about how the election, I'm not talking po politi politics at all, but how that would play out. Um, and we were very confident in the sense that it, it really just doesn't have a factor and didn't have a factor despite how um, kind of unusual it was last year. Um, traditionally strict genres have been separated, you know, art historical, these categories that have been around for a while, we're trying to uh, blur those and have seen some interesting combinations of um, cross category sales, traditional demarcations have been gone, plus this mixing of like high and low pedestrian property. So Christie sold a T-Rex dinosaur for $31 million in a contemporary sale. Um, we had a, a really fun pop culture sale at Bonhams. We are also having um, a sale on like British cool with photographs and cars and um, shoes and fashion that's gotten a tremendous amount of press attention. I thought Sotheby's had a really clever sale entitled Rembrandt to Richter. Again, covering all of those art historical categories. And then you're seeing more of this like 20th century art as opposed to impressionist and post-war and contemporary, which have been sort of the canons for so long at the auction houses. Catalogs is another big topic. Um, there have been so many delays in mail. I got a Christmas card yesterday, I kid you not. So that's one factor, but also kind of the savings that we've seen on production and postage um, has been really a, a driver in how we produce catalogs, why we produce catalogs. Some of our sales, jewelry sales, are doing away with catalogs altogether. We're finding that we don't need them. People are looking online and we have this uh, amazing ability to, to create these e-turning catalogs, which are um, incredibly effective and have allowed us extra time to source property. Um, I don't think catalogs will disappear 100%, at least no time in the future. There perhaps will be fewer print, print runs. And I know that there are some buyers and important collectors that absolutely need to see things in paper. So we will continue to do that for them for the time being. Um, I mentioned private sales briefly. I think um, private sales are happening at the auction houses, not just at galleries and dealers, and not just at the multi-million dollar level, but you know, we've seen that price dip down to much lower points, you know, $50,000 kind of esoteric American um, artists were selling those privately. And that is certainly something that hadn't happened uh, to my mind before last year. Private sales have been advertised on auction websites. Again, that was kind of new and sometimes even with the asking price. So sort of, again, blurring that line between what's private and public. Um, something else we've seen is what's called sealed bid auctions. Again, this is a hybrid between a private sale with the competitiveness of a public auction sale where the work is offered to a, a discrete group. So Sotheby's, this is ad, had been advertised. Um, they offered a Giacometti Grand Femme from 1960, very desirable, with a minimum uh, beginning sealed price of 90 million. And ultimately we don't know what it sold for because again, the price was not disclosed and it was effective strategy for that kind of uh, piece of property. The aim is to get all the publicity, but, but none of the risk, you know, if there are no uh, BI, so it's all confidential. In terms of buyers, we've certainly seen uh, an increase in the 30, 40 year old uh, buyer category coming to auction for the first time. They're buying at a lower threshold, um, what we would call mid market under $50,000 to 1000. And they are a demographic that's very comfortable with online pur purchases. So that's really been great for the business. And globalization is here to, say, here to stay. Um, certainly we've seen in Bonhams how we've worked as a global team across our locations, we use um, Microsoft Teams. So we, we see colleagues in Asia and I, I was on a team with someone in Australia. So it's easier now uh, more than ever to really connect um, globally. 
I think the sales location itself is less relevant. Um, we have auctioneers in every location that might be selling property um, that's physically housed in a different place. And again, more global participation. It's not about the event, but about the desirability of, of the property. Um, as our CEO has said, and I think it's true, the market is efficient. So, you know, as we are doing more digital marketing, I think we're getting to the right people because of the property itself. So there certainly um, is a changed experience. Um, there's this different expectation about a grand scale evening event at the moment. Um, live stream sales are here to stay. They're becoming more polished and will certainly be more of a permanent fixture in selling options. And buyers are more comfortable buying online, sight unseen, without that experience. I mean, I think our two remits that continue are number one, maximizing value for clients. And number two, sometimes, if not equally as important, is celebrating the legacy, telling the story, it might be the story of the provenance or the story of the artist or what the collector has done. Um, and certainly with a marketing focus that's very digital. So um, yes, there are still traditional print ads, but it's more about the video clips, the social media like Instagram, the, the email blast, um, creating landing pages and websites and investing in Google AdWords. Um, it's all tailored to clients' interest and how to sell the property effectively through storytelling um, on a digital focus. So finally, I would just say, you know, without the devastation of, of COVID and the economic downturn, you know, the changes that we brought on in the last six months probably would not have happened at all or certainly would not have happened as quickly. Um, but in a sense, it's been kind of a healthy recalibration of the auction market and, and our business practices. So thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Sherry. Um, and if anyone has any specific questions or any business opportunities or any issues they'd like to discuss, please feel free to reach out directly to Sherry or myself where appropriate. I'll be sure to include her contact information in the follow-up email to this program. As I mentioned at the onset, the goal of these programs is to stay up to date on timely wealth management related topics and to collaborate where appropriate. I think we can all agree that the clients who are best prepared are the ones who are served by a team of knowledgeable advisors. Two more quick items before I let you go. First, if you know anyone who would like to subscribe to my webinar distribution list, please have them send me an email with the word subscribe in the subject line. Second, is that my next webinar is on Thursday, March 4th, entitled Business Income of New Olean Pitfalls and Risks, featuring Boaz Feinberg, head of the tax practice group at Todd Moore Levy, based in Tel Aviv. Tomorrow, I'll send out the registration information to this and all of my upcoming programs. I hope you can attend. And with that, this concludes today's session. Have a wonderful day, everybody.